Hi there. Welcome to Stories That Made Us, the weekly podcast of tales that are brought to us by our fathers and forefathers. This podcast is all about the mythologies and the legends that have defined cultures across the world. The first series delves into the stories of our origin. Stories that are compiled from over a hundred years. This episode begins with the tales of the Native American tribes of the Achomavi, Atsugevi, and the Acoma Pueblo, and concludes with the story of the Ainu, an indigenous tribe of northern Japan. Enjoy! Dark blue water and light blue sky. A vast expanse of aimlessly drifting and chaotic water. A cloudless, featureless sky. This is the Achomavi world before creation, and it was, for a long time, a still and lifeless world. Then suddenly, a wisp of cloud was formed in the sky, and when it cleared, there stood Coyote. Meanwhile, a mist had formed upon the infinite sea, and from this mist rose Silver Fox. They came together, the two eternal spirits, and looked at the vast water. We need a home, they thought, and magically manifested a canoe, which the two boarded. They thus sailed in the unending waters for a long time. For many years the two drifted in the great expanse of the sea. They floated till the canoe became old and mossy and was creaking with every wave. Now Silver Fox was troubled by the lack of life and beauty in the world. He wished nothing more than to have all sorts of animals and plants populating the world. He could not convince Coyote, however, who was completely against creation. Coyote did not wish to share the world with any new beings. So for many years the two just floated in the water, growing lonelier with time. Eventually, Silver Fox realized that there was no way to get Coyote on board. Silver Fox had to proceed with creation himself. So one day, when Coyote was asleep, Silver Fox quietly began brushing his mane. Strands of silver hair fell as he brushed, and very soon, Many hairs were lying on the canoe. These hairs he then took in his hands and spread them upon the water. Magically, the hairs turned to dry solid land. Land that floated upon the endless water. Silver Fox spied this land and was ecstatic. Finally, the world was beyond plain blue water. Silver Fox then imagined and willed a tree with branches and leaves, and there grew a majestic green tree. Then came mountains, rivers, and great plains. Silver Fox made fruits, berries, and all sorts of grains. Through his will, He wished a verdant green world. He created everything we see today, all of creation, with nothing but his imagination and will. Now, with land upon the water, it was not long before the old canoe began drifting towards the shore. Silver Fox shook Coyote and screamed in joy. Wake up, Coyote! Look, look, we have found land! We can finally alight from this old canoe. You can now stretch your legs. 
Coyote woke up with a start and looked around. He rubbed his eyes, for he could not believe what he saw. What is all this? How did this come to be? He questioned. Oh, I don't know, lied Silver Fox. It was all here when we arrived. Silver Fox had no intention of divulging the creator, for he knew how opposed Coyote was to creation. It was good that Coyote was too engrossed with the new land to investigate further. He hopped up on the shore and ran from one end to the other marveling at this beautiful green land. He laughed as he saw cherries and plums and trees swinging to the winds. Silver Fox, amused at Coyote's excitement, also came ashore and calmly said, I think we should build a house here. We have spent too long floating in the canoe. He got no argument from Coyote, who was too busy savoring the new land. Silver Fox thus built a lovely little cottage, one that was surrounded by fruit-bearing trees and flower-laden plants. Everything in this world was desirable. All was beautiful. Except there was no company. Silver Fox and Coyote were all that there was to this world. There were no animals and no people to partake and share in this beautiful, bountiful world. Silver Fox then made little stick figures out of wild plum shrubs and put them around the house wishing that one day these stick figures would turn to animals and people of all kinds. Then one night, when no one was looking, these little stick figures indeed came alive, turning to graceful animals and beautiful people. There were animals, birds and fish of all shapes and sizes, some of these stick figures became people, people who walked on two feet and looked like Silver Fox and Coyote. To these people, Silver Fox then gave speech, intellect, and a heart full of love. He ordained humanity to be the protector and guardian of all creation. Eventually, Man would light fire and discover metals. They would make weapons for hunting and houses for shelter. They would live together in peace and harmony, living in the loving lap of nature. They would bring joy and happiness to all. That is the creation tale of the Achomavi tribe. We now travel a few miles to their Californian neighbors, the Atsugevi. The Atsugevi tale resembles that of the Achomavi, the tribes being in close geographical and cultural proximity with each other. They are both called the Pit River tribes of Northern California, and they interacted extensively throughout history. While Achomavi translates to the river people, the name Atsugevi implies pine tree people. Silver Fox and Coyote remain the protagonists of our story, and the two lived happily in the sky, for there was nothing under, nothing but endless desolate water. Silver Fox was eager to create life, but Coyote was adamantly against it. Silver Fox, however, was not about to give up so easily. He waited patiently for his chance to explore the world beneath. The wait did not last long. For one day, 
while Coyote was off to get word. Silver Fox shot an arrow and punched a hole through the sky below. He looked down the hole and inspected the world. He found nothing. Nothing but infinite ocean. Afraid that Coyote will discover the hole and fill it up, Silver Fox hid it before Coyote returned. He then waited for the next opportunity to discreetly observe the world. The next time, when Coyote was out again, Silver Fox wasted no time and descended through the hole into the vast water. There, he made for himself a small island for he wished to reside and to shape the world from there. Meanwhile, Coyote returned and was aghast to find Silver Fox missing. He looked and searched all around, but could not find a trace of his friend. Eventually, he discovered the hole and peeped down. Silver Fox was upon a tiny island in the middle of the ocean. Wondering what was going on, Coyote hailed Silver Fox, but he got no response. Curious and somewhat apprehensive, Coyote decided to investigate, and thus he descended to the tiny island as well. Coyote barraged Silver Fox with questions the moment he landed. But Silver Fox just calmly told him that this island is to be his new home, no matter what Coyote did to convince him otherwise. Coyote, though annoyed, chose to stay with his friend, thus settling down on the island as well. All was good for the first few days, but eventually the little island began to feel too small for the two of them. Silver Fox thus decided to stretch the land and he pushed his foot and stretched the earth out in all four directions. This he did for another five days expanding the island more and more each day. Coyote, of course, wasn't paying attention while Silver Fox was doing all this. Then one fine day, he just noticed that the island was much larger than before. Finally, finding enough space to stretch his legs, Coyote ran around and explored the land. Silver Fox sensed Coyote's enthusiasm and asked him to run and measure the perimeter. This was easy the first few days, but by the end, an exhausted Coyote gave up. This is impossible, he said. This is an island no more. It's a continent. Silver Fox then proceeded to build a spacious house for the two of them. When Coyote returned tired from his daily frolic, Silver Fox said, Look, I've built us a house. Why don't you go inside and spread some grass on the floor? Sleep there. Coyote liked the idea and did exactly as his friend suggested. Silver Fox, of course, just wished some time for himself. Time to plan his next creation. And so, he sat and pondered upon how the land should be. He realized that while there was land, there was no food or shade. So he made trees and shrubs. He imagined and brought to life fruit-bearing trees and flowering shrubs. He also sculpted the land, making mountains and valleys, springs and rivers. 
He created the world as we see today. He then made the animals and finally man. As his last act of creation, Silver Fox gave man authority over all living beings. He impressed upon our ancestors the need to be kind and gentle. He instructed us to take care of the world that he bestowed to us. This Silver Fox ordained to be the purpose of humanity. Coyote and Silver Fox then retired to enjoy the fruits of their labor. They walked among their creation, living happily and contented lives. Thus end our stories from the Californian Native American tribes. The next tale takes us south, all the way to New Mexico. We are approximately 60 miles from Albuquerque, in the land of the Acoma Pueblo tribe. Their story is a fascinating tale of two girls who were born in a deep and dreary underground world called Ship Papu. Here, in this world, there was no light, and the two infants could only feel one another. They had nothing to see, for nothing existed. Nothing but a caretaker spirit, Sishtinako. She would look after the infants, providing for them when they could not. Eventually, the two sisters grew up to be young girls. Then one day, when the spirit Sishtinako came to them, they asked her, who are we? What is our name? Why are we here? Sistinako refused to reply, only answering that they were underground and that she would care for them till they were old enough to go up into the light. She told the girls to have patience, for all shall be revealed soon. And so they waited. They waited for a long time, learning to speak and pray. When all was ready and the time was right, Sistinako gifted the two sisters two baskets, baskets with seeds and little images of all kinds of creations. These baskets are sent by your father, Uxiti, the spirit said. You are ordered by him to create the world. That is your great task. In these baskets, you will find all that you need to go to the realm of light and begin creation. The girls were utterly confused. Sistinako thus explained further. In your basket, you will find seeds to four kinds of pine trees. Plant them first by tossing the seeds on the ground. The girls could not see the seeds, nor did they know what they felt like. So they questioned the spirit till the pine seeds were found, which they then threw on the ground. The four pine seeds sprouted, but barring sunlight, they took a while to grow. It was to be many years for the little plants to turn to mighty trees. The girls, meanwhile, slept, for they had nothing else to do. Years went by, and the girls just waited and slept. Until one day, they woke up to find that one of the pine trees had punched a hole through the earth above, letting in very little sunlight. The hole, though, was not large enough for the twins to pass. So Sistinako advised the two to look into their baskets again and find the image of a badger. She then showed the girls how to give life to the little animal 
and how to instruct it to bore a larger hole. The sisters did as advised and brought the badger to life. They then instructed the animal to make the hole wider so the sisters could pass through. They also cautioned it not to climb to the surface of the earth, but to dutifully report back once the hole was wide enough. The badger followed the instructions to the letter, and upon completion of its task, was rewarded handsomely. You shall come up with us to the light, the two girls said. There you will live happily. You will always know how to dig and your home will be the ground where you will never be too hot nor too cold. This is your reward, little friend, for helping us. Sishtinako then asked the girls to look for the locust so that it may fly up and smooth the hole by plastering it. It too was cautioned not to go above the earth and to return right away. But the locust dallied, and against instructions, it did go out to see the earth above. This annoyed the girls, who said to the locust, You will also come up with us, but will be punished for disobedience. Your home will also be the ground, but you will be short-lived and you will die soon. Although, for your help, you will be reborn each season. The gap to the surface of the earth was now large and smooth enough for the sisters to climb up. Sishtinako thus said, Take your baskets with you and climb up the pine tree that you planted. Wait for the sun to come up and note that direction to be east. Then take the corn seeds from the basket and with it pray to the sun, asking for long life and happiness and for success for which you were created. She then taught the girls prayers and creation songs which they were to sing to the sun. Finally, it was time for the twins to climb up to the surface of the earth. The sisters followed the badger and the locust as they climbed the pine tree, and eventually they found their way out of the underground and on to the earth above. Upon reaching the top of the earth, they set down their baskets, and for the first time, they looked at the light, at each other, and at the surroundings. It took a while for their eyes to adjust, but when they did, they were breathtaken by the beauty of the light. Immediately, they began praying to the sun. Time had now come to name the two girls. The first, Sishtinako named Iatiku, the bringer of life. She then noticed that the second child had more items in her basket, so she named her Natsiti, which means more of everything in the basket. These then are the names of the twins who would go on to create the world. The spirit then divulged all she knew to the twins. I did not make you. Your father, Uxiti, did. He first made the world with his own clotted blood. And then he made you in his own image. He says that the world is not yet complete and has tasked you to rule and bring to life the rest of the things that he's given in the basket. He has instructed me to be your guide in this quest, and I have been with you at his command, caring for you and teaching you all you need to know. 
Sister Nako then taught the girls how to create plants and animals, and how to make mountains and rivers. She showed them how to create small animals, and then the large. She also explained to the two the animals and plants that are edible, and crucially, those that are not. She taught them to make fire so that they could cook and disperse the darkness of the night. And so it was that by and by, our world took shape. However, all was not well. The twins began to have selfish thoughts. Natsiti schemed to get the better of Iatiku. She often wandered into the woods, making bold plans in her head to outdo her sister. Then one day, while Natsiti was off scheming, she met Pishuni the serpent. Why are you so lonely and unhappy? The serpent asked. I can make you happy, if only you would listen. I know that you are without company, and so you are lonely. Think, if only you could bear a child, then you would no longer be alone. You would have someone to love and care for. Natsiki heard this and said, But Sishtinako has forbidden us from having children. These, she says, are the instructions of our father. Why do you want me to have children now? The serpent replied, Sishtinako merely wishes to hold back this happiness from you. She plots with Yatiku to make you unhappy. You have never seen your father. You do not know his wishes, except what the treacherous Sishtinako tells you. Unless you do as I say, you will have to wait a long time to be happy. Intrigued by the serpent's proposition, Natsiti asked what she had to do to create children of her own. The young maiden then followed the instructions and was soon blessed with twin sons. Sistinako, however, was understandably angry. Why have you done this without my instructions? She said. Your father has forbidden you this. From now on, do as you see fit. I will no longer help you anymore. Thus, Sistinako, the kind spirit, departed the earth, leaving the girls to themselves. The twins, however, were happier to be left to their own devices. With no one to answer to, they would do as they please. The first thing they did was to divide all the remaining items in the basket. Now, Natsiti favoured only one of her twin children, and so she gave the other to Iatiku, asking her to take care of the child. Thus, having divided the items, and with one child each, the two sisters decided that it was best to part ways. Iatiku decided to stay where she was, while Natsiti chose to go east. They continued the work of creation that was ordained by their father and birthed our ancestors. They created the seasons and the spirits that we pray to. They laid down the rules of the land, so all could live peacefully with one another. Thus bringing prosperity and harmony among all. This, then, is the story of the Akoma Pueblo tribe.
Our final story for this episode is from the Ainu tribe, an East Asian ethnic group that is native to northern Japan and eastern Russia. Their name means human or the people. In the beginning, the world was a great slushy mix of water and earth. There was nothing to be seen but a great bare sloppy swamp. All the land was just mud floating aimlessly and directionless in the endless seas. It was dark and still all around. Everything was cold, solitary and desolate. Nothing existed. Nothing but the thunder demons in the clouds and the one self-created God, the great Kamui. One day, the god looked down through the clouds and upon the world, and he found nothing but a swampy sludge that was bereft of all creation and life. He was disappointed at the terrible and shocking state the elements were in, and he decided to impart order and begin creating. The god first created a bird spirit, Moshiri Korkamui, the wagtail bird. This tiny bird, upon orders from Kamui, descended from heaven to create the world. A quick look at the dire state of the earth, however, invoked terrible restlessness and dread. The bird realized that his first task was to separate the land from the water. So, he fluttered his wings over the ocean and trampled it with his feet. He beat the slushy sea down with his tail. He did this for a long time. Eventually, after all the flapping, trampling and tail wagging, dry places emerged. Land arose from the waters. Thus, the world was gradually created as dry land emerged out of the ocean and floated upon it. This bare land, however, was only a prototype of our Earth. It was nothing like what we see today. Kamui, the great primordial deity, employed no less than 60 pickaxes to bring some shape to the land. When satisfied with his work, the god discarded all his tools, which remained back in our world. There they lay, unattended and uncared for, gradually decaying and decomposing. When far advanced in their rot, some of these tools turned to demons, while others to bad water and disease-carrying swamps. The chief of these demons is Nitat Inaharak, the aunt of swamps, and she lives in the low marshlands. Most of the evil ghosts are her offsprings. They go by the name of Toehemra. These ghosts have very large bodies and huge heads. The hairs on their head are always rough and stand perfectly upright. They haunt people at night and are rarely seen. Now, if you have the misfortune to meet one of these creatures, you are to shout and say, Demon, I have news. At the other end of the world, there is another demon, one who has been spreading rumors about you. He says that he would give you a sound thrashing if you were to ever cross his path. This you say, and upon hearing this, 
the demon would immediately leave to hunt the other demon across the world. Finally, let me tell you about the land of Yezel. It is said that Yezel was made by two deities who were deputized by the great Kamui. So, when Kamui commanded Ayoina and his sister Tureshmat to sculpt Yezel, he gave her the western portion while her brother got the southern and the eastern lands. They, being siblings, engaged in their little rivalry, competing against each other and seeing who would sculpt the fastest. As the goddess was working, she happened to meet a friend and stopped to have a chat with her. So while she spent her time gossiping, her brother Ayoina continued his work, nearly finishing his portion. When Tureshmat finally realized how behind she fell, she hastened to finish her portion of the land, giving little regard to quality. This is why the western coast of Yezo is rugged and dangerous. So then, this concludes the episode. I hope you enjoyed the first stories of the series. If you did, please do subscribe. Help us out by leaving a feedback and a rating. The show notes are in the links in the description. Follow us on social media for latest updates on our podcasts and blogs. And finally, do share with your friends and family. Thank you for listening and we shall meet again in the next episode where we talk about the Aztecs. Goodbye.